The gospel invites us to take the lowest place, and that means Jesus uh, advises us to be humble. And there is therefore good reason to uh, use the opportunity to say a few words about the virtue of humility. The book of Sirach in the first reading also makes some suggestions about it. It says, My child, conduct your affairs with humility, and you will be loved more than a giver of gifts. Humble yourself the more the greater you are, and you will find favor with God. And it proceeds to say that the wise man uh, appreciates proverbs, so little tiny sayings, rather than long lectures about cosmology and the like, so the kind of thing I was invited to come to do here, that is uh, yesterday and also tomorrow, um, because I'm teaching philosophy, after all, at our Dominican School of Philosophy and Theology. Nevertheless, there is something like the virtue of intellectual humility, where you listen before you speak, and where you are aware of your limitations. Even a good pagan philosopher like Socrates knew this, he famously said, I know that I do not know. I know that I know nothing. That is a gesture of humility. And indeed, he was not worried even about the rejection of the people of Athens, who eventually put him to death even. That is, again, is a form of humility, and even a good pagan seems to have known about it. Now, what Socrates says here is important. I think it is not the same as our contemporary relativism. To say that you know that you don't know means that you acknowledge that there is such a thing as truth and that you do not have it and that, therefore, you must seek it. Whereas our contemporary relativism says, well, everyone has his or her own truth, and that means whatever I believe is true, and uh, I'm sort of the center of the world. I determine what is truth, and nobody can challenge me on it. There's nothing beyond me to look for. Now, that is, I would suggest, the opposite of humility. That is the very incarnation of pride, making yourself the center of the world. It might very well be one of the forms that the sin of, against the Holy Spirit takes, because it makes you incorrigible. But ultimately, we have to realize that God is the truth. And God is beyond us. We are not God. We are not the center of the world. And yet that is what has been suggested to us from the beginning by the devil, who says to Adam and Eve, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That is, you know it for yourself. Whatever you think to be good or bad, you're okay. And so that is um, the challenge we have faced ever since, and humility is the antidote to that. So St. Vincent de Paul says, the most powerful weapon to conquer the devil is humility. For as he does not know at all how to employ it, neither does he know how to defend himself from it. And so, how do we do this? Well, first of all, we humble ourselves before God. We acknowledge before God that we are not perfect. We, of course, know that God knows everything. He sees everything. There is no way of hiding anything from God. And bringing that to confession can be a good antidote because uh, we acknowledge it then literally. And so we know before God we are not perfect. However, it seems easier to say that and acknowledge it before God, perhaps even feel good about that. But what about then suddenly a neighbor saying about us bad things or not knowing all the good that we have done? Apparently, that is a bit more difficult to do. And the spiritual masters, therefore, have said that we should even rejoice in other people giving us a bad name. That sounds hard, but it's, uh, for example, here is St. Isaac the Syrian, who says, the limpidity of mercy is known for patience in bearing injury, and the perfection of humility when it rejoices in gratuitous slander. 
So other people slandering you, and you are standing there and not correcting them or not defending yourself. Now, Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, said that humility is just a form of weakness. But just try to do that, just not defending yourself. That takes a lot of strength. And perhaps that is why God, in his providence, in his uh, pedagogy, if you want, took some time to instill this virtue in us. As people have noted in the ancient pagan world, humility was not considered a virtue. Socrates was, in a way, an exception in his own practice, but generally humility was not considered a virtue. In the Old Testament, we do find people humbling themselves before God. So just think of King David in the Psalms, knowing that he had done wrong. But it is only in the New Testament that we find humility as a virtue with regard to our neighbor. So the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, Jesus asking us to turn the other cheek, that is a new thing, and it seems to be difficult to do. One reason why it is difficult to do is because pride is competitive. And I'm not even thinking of material competitiveness, you know, who has the larger SUV and do you have the newest version of the iPhone uh, or where did you spend your uh, vacation and all these kind of questions. It can be very simple things. What about if others disregard me, ignore me, reject me, behave condescendingly toward me? How do I deal with that? Pride, again, lives from competition. It is different from other vices in that. For example, gluttony is not competitive. Right? So if we eat, it's because we enjoy the food, not because uh, you know, um, we eat more than other people. Now, there are competitions of that sort. You know, if you want to get to the Guinness Book of Records, how many hamburgers can you eat? But that is already not gluttony anymore. That is pride, because it's competitive. And so pride makes actually all the vices worse. Greed and avarice wants to have, but pride wants to have more. Vanity wants to be beautiful, but pride wants to be more beautiful. Vain curiosity wants to know many things, but pride wants to know more than that other scholar. And even the devil was not content to be the most beautiful of all angels before the fall. He wanted to make sure that nobody else could be more beautiful than himself. Again, that is pride. What might be the root of that? I sometimes think that competitiveness has to do with low self-esteem. You know, if we are insecure about who we are, we need the approval and the appraisal of other people and want to shine uh, in comparison with others. So, in fact, it is actually not a form of strength. It is a form of insecurity. And we have to remind ourselves that before God, we are like little children. Now, parents uh, delight in whatever their children do for them, they little performances or whatever it might be doesn't mean that they have to be better than everybody else. They will love their children no matter what. If you send your children to uh, some kind of a competition, which is okay, of course, uh, it, so that is okay, but it wouldn't be okay to say, I make my love for you conditional on you winning that contest. That would be terrible. And, it, and God is not like that. God loves us even if we don't win the competition. That is not the point. And so we don't want to be competitive about things. It spoils perhaps even our piety. You know, if we say all these novenas and then we think we are better than the other person, well, we have just ruined the whole thing. You know, the merits that are in that are ruined by the vice of pride. And pride is worse than anything else. It's worse than gluttony because it is a spiritual sin. It goes to the very roots of our being, and it's very hard to eradicate from the soul. If you um, go to confession and you find yourself confessing the same sin over and over again, that might not be the worst thing to happen to you because that at least keeps you humble. 
just think, you know, the next time around said, oh, now I've managed it. I have not to confess this sin anymore. I have done it, right? I take pride in that. Well, that's much worse. Uh, that's uh, so at least it keeps you from that kind of pride, perhaps. As the Desert Fathers used to say, it is better to fail with humility than to succeed with pride. Now, of course, we all have been given good gifts. And Jesus also says we shouldn't put them under the bushel basket. That is, we should let our lights shine. What we do thereby is we let God's gifts shine, not our own. If we hide or if we put down the good things we have been given, that would be wrong too, because that puts down God in his gifts. And therefore, St. Francis de Sales says, humility hides virtue to preserve it, but shows it when love demands it. So if out of love uh, we can give a witness to other people, that can be good motivation. And St. Thomas Aquinas says that if we didn't do so, we would be ungrateful, and we might lose the gifts for which we are ungrateful. So there's a fine line to walk at times. We don't want to ruin the joy that God gives us in his gifts. That would alienate us from God himself, who is the giver of these gifts. And so perhaps the best thing is to think of it as in terms of the second reading from the letter to the Hebrews, the cloud of witnesses, the festal gathering on Mount Zion. That is, the, the witness of all the gifts that God gives and that uh, are part of a community that shares these gifts, that is not competitive, that is not ruined by um, being competitive and jealous and filled of pride. And it is indeed the community whose queen is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And from her we learn how to get it right. She sings in the Magnificat, My soul magnifies the Lord magnifies the Lord, but it is indeed blessed by him, for the the Almighty has done great things for me, but it is the Almighty who has done these things, for he has looked with favor on the humility of his servant, as the more accurate translation might be. And so if we can, in humility, join that festal gathering on Mount Zion together with our Queen, then we can sing with her From this day, all generations will call me blessed, for the Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Amen.